All right. One of the things I would want to maintain is that Christians aren't going to make any headway by trying to split the difference between faith and unbelief. If you have unbelief and faith, yeah. and you split the difference, you just get a muddled form of faith or but a muddled a form of unbelief. What about this idea of Jesus, uh, Christopher? You don't buy it at all, I take it. Well, I don't think he was the son of God. You don't? No, I don't think his mother, was, think a, I don't think his mother was a virgin, and I don't think he died and was resurrected. Or but it's also died. something that can oh. humble you if you think about it uh, right. correctly. It, it makes you, it helps put everything in perspective. But the idea is simply this. We, as believers of God, should have a reason for the belief, uh, have the ability to articulate the reason for why we hold to the hope that we hold to in Jesus Christ. So uh, I believe currently we are in a uh, cycle historically that I think you can find a pattern for. And that is usually you have a group of people that rise up with a firsthand, personal, white hot faith. Then a generation rises up after them in the shadow of that faith. Then a generation rises up behind them doubting that faith. And then a generation comes up behind them not knowing the faith. And I think there's a historical precedent where you see this cycle happening over and over again. Whenever you get to that fourth point in the uh, equation, usually what happens is out of the generation that doesn't know the faith comes up a group of people, mighty men and women who proclaim the faith, hold to the faith, defend the faith, and then you have a generation that's white hot on fire for the faith. I would submit to you that we're in a season where we are uh, more biblically illiterate than we've ever been in American history. That, uh, in fact, Gallup came up with a poll that said 54% of millennials are 35 and under in the country, in the U.S., not outside of the U.S., but in the U.S., uh, that 54% uh, didn't know there was anything religious that had to do with Easter break. Not about a resurrection, not about Christianity, not about any of that. It's just a great weekend off where you don't have to go to school. And so we have a group of people where the starting point has changed in the discussion of faith. Meaning, if you were to go back into the 50s and 60s, there was a general held view of values that we rallied around even if we differed. You could be Jewish, you could be of a different background, ethnically, economically, even a different religious background. But in general, as a country, there was a set held value system that we held to that we no longer can assume that everybody holds on to. In fact, the word freedom has changed in its meaning. If you go back into the 50s and 60s, freedom was the idea of being free to practice what you believe. But what it's become now in today's society is well, the word we would have used back then for autonomy. We don't want freedom, we want autonomy. Autonomy is the ability to be a God in and of myself. It's where I set the moral standard, I determine what's truth for me, I determine what's good and what's bad. I myself sit on the throne as judge, ruler, and God. And so when we say freedom, what we mean is the freedom to be my own God. That's what we want. When it used to mean the freedom to actually be a people who served the God that we chose and lived in community together. And so there's been a difference. When what that means is in the 50s and 60s, you could assume that the starting point of the conversation of faith was with some knowledge of the word. But what we should, as followers of Jesus, do is understand that in this world, we are now having a starting point that if the starting point used to be at five on a scale of knowing God and 10 being the highest end of that scale, we're now at like negative two. So you've got to start pre-Bible, pre-faith, in questions and answering questions that are being asked, such as, is there truth? If there is a God, can he be known? And these questions have not, not been asked throughout human history. They've been asked, out, uh, asked throughout history time and time again. It, it's a cyclical thing that we're in. Does this make sense? So if you go back to like Athanasius and the Greek world that he lived in, the Roman world he lived in, like the questions of the time were, if there is truth, is truth knowable? And we still have these same questions, right? Jesus standing uh, before Pilate, uh, what does Pilate say in response to Jesus' claims? What is truth? Right? What is truth? How, how can we be sure that it's truth? And, and so we see that Jesus was someone, even though he was the son of God, he was a, an apologist. He was a defender of the faith. In the Old Testament, we see logical reason being given for the faith. We see that continuing in the New Testament in Paul's arguments that he would make 
with Roman culture and Roman society who love truth and philosophy. They worship philosophy. And Paul engages them. If you go to uh, Acts 17 where he's at Mars Hill, he begins looking around at all of the gods that they've deified through their philosophical discussion. And he finds one that says to the unknown God because they didn't want to offend any God they had not acknowledged. And Paul says, I want to talk to you about that one because you don't know him. And he lays out that that God is the God of gods. He's the one true God. And he gives a logical defense for his belief that he holds in Christ. So much so that when he's speaking to one ruler on his way to being beheaded, the ruler looks at him after the defense and says, would you have me become a follower of this Christ? And Paul's like, please, yes. And the guy's like, how, how weird would it be for a Roman to be Christian? That, that, that doesn't makes sense that's so in the words of a hip-hop artist uncouth okay <laughs> so here's what we're going to do in response to uh, what I believe is the need for in the church and outside of the church the ability for us to not only have faith but know what faith we have and why we have it so that we can articulate it to the world around us we're going to come back to this theme of liar lunatic or lord several times over the next several years and so in this, perhaps, uh, in this occurrence, I'm going to go through what I'm going to teach or what we're going to teach every week for the next 10 weeks and give you a preview of it in just a minute. But let me tell you why we labeled it this. When you hear uh, that there's a trilemma when it comes to who you proclaim Jesus to be, usually that trilemma, that idea comes from and or is attributed to C.S. Lewis from Mere Christianity. Now, here's what you don't know about preachers. We're all borrowing someone else's old sermons. And the really good ones find sermons that no one ever listened to or are so old that everyone's forgotten about them. So for me, I just recycle my old sermons. That's funny. That's really funny. Sorry. Um, no, actually what I'm doing right now is I'm reading Athanasius, right? Like from 300 AD. Like that's where I'm at right now. And, uh, and, and so... C.S. Lewis gets credit for a lot of things that he didn't actually say, but they were developed ideas that developed well before his time. Now, I went and researched this idea of the trilemma, Jesus being a liar, a lunatic, or Lord, and as far as I could go back was to a Christian preacher named John Duncan, who in uh, 1859... He was born in 1796, lived to 1870. But in 1859, he wrote a book, and it's the first time where we ever see this idea being presented. And he said in that book, and I quote, Christ either deceived mankind by conscious fraud, or he was himself deluded and self-deceived, or he was divine. There's no getting out of this trilemma. It is inexorable, Okay. So that's the first occurrence. Then a guy named Watchman Nee, I'm a fan, Chinese theologian, wrote The Normal Christian Life. He also wrote a book called The Normal Christian Faith. And in 1936, in The Normal Christian Faith, he says this. First, if Jesus claims to be God and yet in fact is not, he is not to be a madman or a lunatic. Second, if he is neither God nor a lunatic, he has to be a liar, deceiving others by his lie. Third, if he is neither of these... He must be God. You can only choose one of the three possibilities. And if you do not believe that he is God, you have to consider him a madman. If you cannot take him for either of the two, you have to take him for a liar. There is no need for us to prove if Jesus, is, uh, Jesus of Nazareth is God or not. All we have to do is find out if he is a lunatic or a liar. If he is neither, he must be the son of God. Then C.S. Lewis comes along and in a sermon in 1942 makes first mention of this and then in 1952 writes the book Mere Christianity when he says this about Jesus, I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept, which is, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher but I do not expect, accept him, his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things that Jesus would say would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg. Think about this. Or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God 
or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let, let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Lewis goes on to write, It seems obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely that it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. This is the trilemma. And this is the most divisive character in human history. Every human being must stumble across the question of who is Jesus. My prayer is that every human being would have the blessed opportunity to ask that question. To study it. To take out the scientific method on it. To state a hypothesis for themselves and then through study and pursuit discover for themselves who the real Jesus is or is not. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we get this text, and it's coming to believers who are facing persecution. Now, to be clear, in 1 Peter, you've got a group of people who have yet to experience high levels of persecution that were yet to come. Stephen's been martyred, but that's not become commonplace at this point by the writing of 1 Peter. Instead, it's more like family ostracizing. It's more like if you become a Christian, you were a Jew, you're kind of outcast from your family, they don't talk about you, they think you've drawn a cult, a cult. They, they pretty much dismiss you. If you were a Roman citizen uh, at this point in time and you've become a believer, then you've likely tur- been seen to be one that's turned your back on the Roman Empire and the Roman government because Christianity was seen as a, seen as a threat to the Roman Empire. And so you're probably seen as someone who's in opposition to Rome, which puts you in danger of being, uh, at this point in time in human history, more than likely socially ostracized than physically harmed. Does this make sense? And so Peter, writing this, not knowing that he himself would be martyred and crucified upside down, he writes to uh, the church about suffering and pain, and he talks about the response to persecution being one of fear or a response of settled hope. You can either respond in fear or you can respond in subtle hope. And essentially, when we get to 1 Peter 3.15, he says this. uh, 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ as Lord and as holy. So you can, in your heart today, honor Christ or you can honor fear. You can operate out of a desire to revere God and honor him, even if that means physical persecution and pain. Or you can live out of fear of, the, of, of looking into the mirror of the world and wanting to honor them. James 4 says that we are to look into the mirror of God's word to look at ourselves. But many of you only check the physical mirror every single morning. Many of you wake up, you look to check your hair, but you never check your spirit when it comes to the Word of God. You, you check what the appearance is, and you'll even ask other people to tell you how you look, yet you don't check your attitude and your demeanor before you walk out the door to see how you spiritually are about to represent Christ or misrepresent Him. It's because you only look into one mirror. You've been actually called to look into and pay attention to more so the mirror of the Word of God than the mirror of the world. And so you and I, listen to me, Uh, You spend time every single morning, you know, fixing the hair, making sure the cowlick's down. But many of you do not look into the word of God. So you live in fear of the opinion of the word instead of revered fear for the leadership and the honoring of God in your living. So what ends up happening is a very lukewarm life and a lukewarm Christianity that's practiced. Because at the end of the day, while you say you revere God, you live with a reverence of man that is greater than a reverence of God. You live with a reverence of public opinion because you're looking into the wrong mirror and not allowing the word of God to read your life. I don't have time to meddle here very long, but I'm just trying to articulate to you that some of you didn't check the right mirror this morning. So what's settled in your heart is fear and worry and not faith and triumph. Am I making sense to anybody? So we're called in 1 Peter 3.15 to allow in our hearts honor for Christ to be the dwelling place in which we live. And then it says this, always being prepared to make a defense. That's the word apologia that we're talking about. To make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Now the context of 
the opportunity that Peter's talking about comes through suffering. And we're going to talk about God being good in the, in the face of suffering and evil in, a, in the weeks to come. But let me be very clear that it's sometimes within the most grave circumstances of this world that the greatest of light that is in you shines through. That sometimes it is in the midst of suffering where the hope that you hold to is revealed. Because anybody can keep it together when things are going right. But it's when this broken world acts broke that we discover not only where your hope is, but where the hope of the world lies. And when your hope rests in an eternal king who's reigning, ruling, and returning, then you can have confidence in difficult times because your king hasn't been dismissed from the throne, even though your circumstances seem to be rearing their ugly head at you. That was free. Just throwing that out there. So we are to give a defense to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope that we hold. Let me just be clear. 1 Peter 3.15, and in the, in the age that we live in, I believe, put us in a position as followers of Jesus where this must be true of us. And this is why we're doing this series. In an age of skepticism and cynicism, there is no room for Christians to be ignorant or unable to articulate what we believe. It's unacceptable. Now, it's okay for you to recognize and admit today, I don't know what I believe, but I believe it. But it's not okay for you to stay there. But we must put effort and passion and intensity into the study of what we proclaim to be truth. So over the next 10 weeks, here's where we're going go to go. Today, I'm going to explain the what and why of apologetics. Next week, I'm going to tell you we're having a guest speaker because I'm expecting you to still show up because it's a great guest speaker. Pastor Kevin Scott from Church at the Well in Boston, Massachusetts is going to be out here preaching. And he's going to be, he planted a church in East Boston, which is extremely non-Christian. Uh, anti-evangelical even and his experience has given him lots of stories and ammo to share about how to be Christian in a post-Christian world and so he's going to come and teach us on what does it mean to be Christian in a world that's against the gospel that's next week in, in three weeks you get Mother's Day guess what we're going to talk about on Mother's Day what is the difference between biblical femininity and toxic femininity happy Mother's Day some of you are like, I'm coming to that and I'm bringing her. <laughs> Week four. We're going to go through and answer the question, is the Bible accurate and trustworthy, a.k.a. is the Bible actually God's word? After all, if the Bible was written by men, how can it be from God? We'll talk about that. Week five. Start praying for me now. We're going to answer the question. Isn't homosexuality just something you're born with? Is the Bible's teachings about, uh, about sexuality merely old-fashioned, oppressive, bigoted teaching? That'll be fun. Didn't get any amens or laughter on that one. Doubt it will be a great, comfortable Sunday for any of us. All right. Week six. Some of you are like, I strangely have a vacation plan. <laughs> Week six. Has God provided enough evidence in science and in history for rational belief? That gets two parts. Week seven will be the same thing in part two form. Week eight, what is the difference between biblical, that's Father's Day, masculinity and toxic masculinity, a.k.a. Gillette commercials? <laughs> Week nine, how can God be good and allow evil to exist? Week 10, how can Christianity be true when the church tolerates and practices injustice? Slash, does the hypocrisy of Christians prove the faith to be invalid. Week 11. How can Christians believe that there is only one way to heaven? Isn't that closed-minded and narrow and a narrow way of thinking? So there's the series. Now in about a year, I'm going to come back and I'm going to go into the Old Testament and go through all the Old Testament miracles and give apologetic explanations for everything, including Genesis. Why is it a year away? Because I need more time. I'm studying. So today, what and why? What and why? We already talked about the fact that the word apologia is the word for apologetics that we have in our English language. It appears eight times in the New Testament. I gave you 1 Peter 3.15. There's seven other occurrences that we've not mentioned. If you want to look these up for yourself, I would love for you to read your Bible at any point in time. So if me giving you verses randomly, just throwing out stuff, gets you to read your Bible, 
Yay. Uh, here we go. Seven other occurrences in the Bible. Acts 22.1, Acts 25.16, Acts 22.1 and Acts 25.16. 1 Corinthians 9.3, we see the word apologia there. 2 Corinthians 7.11, Philippians, if you're not using abbreviations, you probably should start. Chapter 1, verse 7 and verse 16. And then finally, 2 Timothy 4.16. We see this word used seven times. Essentially, apologetics is about defending the core tenets of the faith. What are the core tenets of the faith? There's a lot that we say is closed-handed that's not going to be mentioned right now, but if I were to give a summary of the core tenets of the faith that we defend through apologetics, it's five things. Number one, it's the fact that God exists. This is actually not a very hard one to defend, but one that's still discussed a lot. God exists. Number two, that God created the universe. It's a lot of fun in defending that one. Number three, core tenets of the faith, that Jesus is God. Not created by man, not created by God, not a figment of our imagination, not a good teacher, not a human, but a God-man who became human. He was God and he wrapped himself in flesh. We'll talk about that more in the weeks to come. Jesus is God. Number four, Jesus rose from the dead. The entire faith hangs on that. And number five, God is best described through the Trinity, according to Scripture. So, how do we defend the faith? Well, my grandpa used to say this, God said it, that settles it, you should believe it. (laughs) Unfortunately, in a post-Christian world, the world goes, meh, whenever you say that. We do not live in a world where you go walk on the campus of BHS, get a room full of teenagers and go, God said it. Uh, when I, I messed up the saying God said it, that settles it, now believe it. it outside of the Holy Spirit which this is what it takes for conversion to happen at any point that it happens outside of the Holy Spirit making a revival happen because he's done more with less words in the past you in general are not going to answer the questions of people to where they go, Let, tell me more about that essentially what you just said to them is I can't rationalize with this person because they are not rational You may not like that that's the way that they think, but that's the way the world will think in response to that. So, apologetics is done in three ways. Number one, it is done by studying various fields. So the way that we defend the faith is through the study of various fields. That means you have to take an interest in some things, and there's one that's primary and three that are secondary, but there's a uh, four part to this that I think we need to be diverse or at least somewhat versed in, and we're going to do our best over the next three years. Give us three years, we'll help you defend the faith better than you were three years ago, okay? But uh, essentially, we believe that these fields must be brought into discussion if you're going to rationalize and talk to people Uh, about faith. The first is foundational for us, and that's theology, which is the study of God and his revelation of God, or in the revelation, uh, in his revelation to us, which is his word. So we've got to be people of the book, people of the word, people who know what we believe. That means things like homarchiology and soteriology and eschatology and other ologies become more and more familiar to us. Does this make sense? And I, I want to be very clear, this is not for pastors or seminary students, it's for believers. We've professionalized theology to where we've made you think the pastor will tell you what you need to know. That is bumpus. You live in an information age where you have more access to information than at any other time in human history. You can study the Word of God. You can buy today a program called Logos and go and learn Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic and studies in Old Testament studies and New Testament studies. You can audit seminary classes on your own time just to learn more. There is plenty out there to feed the hungry, but the problem is in an information age in our culture where there aren't many people that are actually hungry. Why? Because I can Google it when I need it. So instead of preparing the tools beforehand, you pray to God that Google will give you the tool in the moment you need it. Which, by the way, while we should be stewards and be preparers of the faith in knowing what we believe, we trust in the Holy Spirit to give us recall of what we believe in the right time to communicate what we believe. So we're not merely going through a Jehovah's Witness list of step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. 
end of presentation, what do you think? Instead, we're able to have real conversations where, you ready? We listen. Let me help you out, Christians. If you're not a Christian, you're going to amen me on this one. One of the best things we can start doing is listening. Not listening to rebuttal, but listening to actually understand. This would revolutionize your marriage. <laughs> so why don't you start practicing it with your closest neighbor and try tonight just listening. Husband, don't try and fix them. Just listen. And at the end of it, communicate that your desire is to understand them. And then watch what happens as the church explodes with growth. Seven people got that. <laughs> so we communicate, we defend the faith by studying various fields. One of those fields is theology. The other is philosophy. That's the study of deep questions while using logic. Paul does this, and we see him do it in the book of Acts. When he's at Mars Hill, when he's standing in the courts with people, when he goes out and talks to people in the synagogue, he's using philosophy and thoughts and questions of the day. One of the big problems that the church had back at one point in time in American history is they stopped answering questions that people were asking. Whenever you're asking, answering questions that no one's asking, you end up becoming absolutely irrelevant to the society that you're in. I believe that the scriptures speak to every need of the human heart. The problem is, is we stop listening in, to the question, so that we, we, and, and in doing so, we stopped answering the questions that they were asking. I know there's questions you want them to ask, but before they ask the questions you want them to ask, you usually got to answer the questions that they want to ask first. Just a hypothesis here, okay? That's philosophy, the study of the questions using logic. Then we have history, especially ancient history, studying ancient history. Why? Because everything is cyclical. The Bible says there's nothing new under the... Son, that means the uh, heresies of the day and all of the stupidity that we throw up today is not new. It's recycled. And if you know history, you can go back in history and go, hey, this entire society thought that and look at what happened. Let's not repeat that, right? Number four, we defend the faith by studying various fields. The fourth field is the field of, are you ready? Science. Bill Nye, the science guy. Okay. Here's what's amazing about this. Actually, I'm going to come to that in just a second. All right, I won't say that. Number one, how do we do apologetics? Number one, we do it by studying the study of various fields. Number two, we do it by pointing out inadequ the inadequacies of other claims. Okay, let me be very clear that for a lot of you, this is where you get uncomfortable because you do not like any kind of conflict at all. So you'll let everyone say lies around you, and it takes like, you know, basically them short of crucifying you before you actually speak up for yourself or speak up for the truth. As believers, it is our job when we see a lie to put light on the lie. Okay? It's our job when we hear something that's wrong to be able to defend why it's wrong. Not just that's wrong. A lot of us can point out something's not right there. The difference is can you actually articulate why it's not right? Can you give a defense for it? Are you tracking with me? And so we point out the inaccuracies of other claims. Now, this may sound offensive, but I'm just going to run through these quickly, and we'll go through them later in another date and time. But one claim is that Jesus never died. That started in Islam. It's actually written in their book that Jesus never died. Okay, that's a claim that we can defend against, right? Whoa, okay. That's a claim that we're hopefully going to help you be equipped to defend against because there's a lot of logical reasoning that goes into the fact that Jesus didn't sort of die. He died, died. Okay? You don't go through a scorching, carrying a cross, and then get hung naked on the cross and have a professional executioner pronounce you as dead. Instead of breaking your legs, puncture your side where water and blood flowed, they've done autopsies on. This is where so medical science actually helps the faith. It never hurts the faith. They did an autopsy on what happened. It's like that his heart ruptured. It burst on the cross. Literally, God gave his all for us on the cross, pouring out his life for us on the cross to be redeemed. And he did it in such an extent his heart literally blew up. On top of that, three days later, which you have to give an account for, Jesus begins walking around and appearing, and he's not recognizable because the only scars he bears are not the scars of the scourging, but the scars of the nails. And they didn't even recognize him. 
You don't walk seven miles after a crucifixion, even if you've been resuscitated. You don't unwrap yourself from the wrappings that were wrapped around you in a burial because they were upwards of, uh, I think it's 70 pounds. I need to go back and check that fact. Someone should check that. But when they put the burials around you, it was a heavy weight. And you don't, from the inside being tied down, unwrap yourself and get out. It is a miracle. It is the work of God. It is a resurrection that we celebrate. But one of the claims out there is that Jesus never died. He was merely in a deep coma. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It is absolutely illogical. You have to be able to defend against the inaccuracies of other claims. One claim is that the natural world is all that exists. That's a claim given by naturalism and atheism. And we're going to go and look at how science is actually pointed to a creator and not just happenstance that made everything happen. Just, just a big accident that brought everything into existence. Another claim is that the purpose of life is to escape our sense of self. That's the claim given by Buddhism. And that's their worldview. And we live in a counterclaim to that. Or that the Book of Mormon is historically accurate. That's a claim given by Mormonism, and it continues to prove to be inaccurate. And has to continue to be edited over and over again. This is a problem. Some of you are like, well, hasn't our Bible been edited? Nope. I can go back and defend it and show you. We'll have a lot of fun with that. So this is going to be a great series. Very encouraging. So we defend the faith by pointing out the inadequacies of other claims. Number three... We defend the faith by building relationships with others. And this is the key thing to everything I've just said. I want to be very clear about this. Relationship building is key to, de to a defense of the faith. Meaning, you and a bullhorn is not going to help us. But you inviting your neighbor who has a different worldview to your table to listen, to understand, to find common ground with them and to articulate your belief. This is how change happens. If we could just figure out how to get Republicans and Democrats to actually eat together and, and love each other, then we could get a whole lot more done in this daggum country, okay? But the problem is, is we have bullhorns in our government and no one actually sits down and gets anything done. So everything takes longer than it should because we are poor at developing relationships culturally. So what is relationship?